I'm very excited about the series that we have going this semester. I'll not be doing the introductions for the other two talks because Trevor Hancock, our speaker for tonight, has organized these three talks and will be introducing the other two speakers. Uh, I'll mention them though so that you just have the dates and names in mind. All three talks are focused on the theme of making uh, cities healthier with the exclamation after the colon, it's not about healthcare. So Trevor will uh, uh, begin to tell us why that's the case today uh, with his talk, Healthy Cities, Past, Present, and Future. Then on February 28th, um, we have a talk from Jason Corburn from the University of California, Berkeley, Making Healthy and Equitable City Planning Work. And then the final talk of the year, and of these three, on March 21st, first, rather, uh, Sharon Friel, who's coming all the way from the Australian National University, um, The Challenge of Improving Urban Health and Global Equity, and Equity Globally, rather. Uh, all three of them major figures in this field, uh, and I think friends and collaborators with one another in major global initiatives, uh, and I think a really exciting lineup for us on this topic. Tonight, I'll introduce Dr. Trevor Hancock, who is a public health physician and was for a short time a family physician, and a health promotion consultant, currently professor and senior scholar at the newly established School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria here. He has a lengthy um, list of accomplishments and a very active career of promoting public health and urban health and community health. Uh, really exciting, interesting uh, bio to read through. I'll just read very selectively to you from it. Over the past 25 years, he's worked as a consultant for local communities, municipal, provincial, and national gov governments, healthcare organizations, NGOs, and the World Health Organization. He was an advisor and a consultant to the WHO's Europe's Healthy Cities Initiative, and co-authored the original background paper for that project in 1986. He was the principal consultant for Healthy Toronto 2000, a separate project, and he wrote the proposal for and was a consultant to the Canadian Healthy Communities Network. He was the founding chair of the Ontario Healthy Communities Coalition, has consulted to Healthy city and community projects in several other countries, most notably Sweden and the United States, as well as across Canada, and has recently helped to reestablish the BC Healthy Communities Initiative. He has received many honors, including an honorary life membership to Canadian public, to, uh, in, in the Canadian Public Health Association. He served as vice president of the American Public Health Association in the early 90s. He received an honorary award from the U.S. Healthy Cities and Communities Coalition, a life membership in the Ontario Public Health Association, an appointment as Regents Lecturer in the School of Public Health at the University of California at Berkeley, among other awards. To add some levity to his bio, he tells us that he uh, practices a traditional form of dance that uh, we can imagine as a form of rugby without violence. Uh, traditional Scottish dance, is it? English dance. Uh, Dr. Trevor Hancock. Thank, thank you, Jordan, and good evening. Um, one of my fellow Morris dancers is back there in the audience. Uh, we might do a little dancing for you later, which is very good. Um, my wife's also in the audience, which is a very unusual occurrence. She doesn't often get to hear me speak, and right now I know that what's going through her mind is, what, my tea? So, <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, try and paint a very big picture of healthy cities in the next um, three hours. And, uh, and like, like Gaul, my presentation is divided into three parts, so I'm going to talk about past, present, and future. Not exactly the most original and exciting uh, title, but it, it describes it quite well. <clears throat> I wanted to um, start, however, with um, this slide. 
um, because this was the uh, mission statement that I developed when I was the health director. It wasn't just me, but the Department of Public Health. Um, when uh, I was hired in the early 80s in a very exciting new initiative in Toronto uh, to, to develop really a new form of municipal public health. And I'll talk more about Toronto later. But we came up with this mission statement that our mission as a department was to make, or actually to help make, Toronto the healthiest city in North America. And having said that, we were faced with two really interesting questions that we hadn't thought much about, which is what does that mean? And, and what does it imply? How do we get there? So a lot of what Healthy Cities is all about, in, 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 for me, in the last 30 years, is trying to answer those two questions. And the first is somewhat easier than the second, but what is a healthy city and how do we get there? So often when I start, um, if I'm working with communities, I go around and ask people to think back over the last year or so uh, about something that when they think about it, they go, oh, now there's an example of what a healthy city is. And I had thought of doing that tonight, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. But you might just want to take a moment yourselves to think about that. And what, if you think back over the last year, um, it could be any community anywhere in the world, and you go, hmm, now that's an example, now I think about it, of what a healthy city or a healthy community is. And, and you get very interesting answers. Uh, one of the answers you seldom get, and, and it sort of relates to the title really of the whole series, is it's not about healthcare. And in fact, usually I find that almost nobody mentions healthcare. Um, and you always have to remind them that that's a piece of it. Uh, my two favorite answers, well, this was in one of the early days, um, and we did this with, and this was an environmental health officer, a public health inspector in the city of Toronto. Um, so not surprising for a public health inspector, but of course, very, very astute. It really is very, very important for the health of the city, and if you go back and look at our history, uh, that's a big issue. And then the second was my own experience when I first thought of it which was that when I was in Copenhagen one day, on Saturday morning, I got caught in a stroller jam in, in, uh, in Strogut. Uh, and I thought that was an example of a healthy city, that so many people were out in the center of the city with their kids that you actually have a stroller jam. So, I'm gonna start with a relatively recent and very selective history of healthy cities. And I say relatively recent, I, I was going to start with the Renaissance uh, cities of northern Italy and their boards of health, but that, I just decided in the end, I don't have time for all of that, but it was very interesting, uh, his piece of history. Uh, Carlo Capolo wrote a great book about it 30 years ago, if you want to read it. So let me start instead with this, the Health of Towns Commission, 1843 in England. Triggered by Edwin Chadwick's report on the sanitary condition of the labouring population in 1842, came out of his work with the Poor Law Commission, um, looked at the, the, the sanitary arrangements in 50 English towns, and, and um, its recommendations led, among other things, to the Public Health Act of 1848 and the General Board of Health. So really, the origins of public health and, and, and the notion of health in towns or healthy cities are, are synonymous. Uh, and the impact of that commission was that it established the sanitary idea. It led to public health measures such as housing standards. And we, we forget about that sometimes. I had a student many years ago now, um, <clears throat> when I was in Toronto, and he went back into the archives of the city of Toronto. And what he found was that uh, in about a third of the occasions when a new department was being established, and he went back to 1835 when the city was, uh, got its charter, um, in about a third of the occasions, health in some way was a reasonably significant reason for setting up the department. In another third of the cases, health was a contributory reason to setting up the department. So it was in there. So, so housing standards came out of a concern for health. Sewer systems, of course, hygiene regulations, proper public water supplies, and so on. And, and the first Health in Towns Association was established at a meeting in Exeter in 1844. So this has been around for a long time, and of course it was established in response to these type of conditions. And I'm not going to read this, you can scan it for yourselves, but this was Frederick Engel's description of what Manchester looked like in 1845, the River Irk. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that some of these same conditions are what you would find if you went into some of the, um, the, the, the cities of the lower and middle income countries, particularly the lower income countries, and into their, their slums and informal settlements today. 
uh, and, and in fact you'll hear about some of that from uh, Sharon Friel and, and also from Jason Corbin. Uh, so those conditions and these conditions, this was a few years later, but uh, Hippolyte Taine, who was a, a, a French um, sort of a, a critic and historian, uh, writing about what he saw when he came to Manchester in 1859, I don't know why everybody picked on Manchester, but they seem to. Uh, but, but the health impact of these sorts of conditions, and again, think about where you'd find these in the world today, because you still do find these conditions. Um, the life expectancy in mechanics and laborers in 1842 in Manchester was 17 years. That's worse than anything you'll find pretty much in the world today, I think. Um, we, we, don't, we haven't got quite that bad, although I, I suspect you could find places where that is the case. But, but appalling, appalling public health consequences of these appalling living and working conditions. <clears throat> so in response to that, one of the responses at least, and one of my heroes in all of this, uh, I actually set up a consulting company at one point with some friends, which we called Hygea. Um, and it was in honor of um, Sir Benjamin Ward Richardson, who was a self-professed disciple of Edwin Chadwick and one of the great public health leaders, sanitarians, in, in Victorian England. And in 1875, he went to Brighton, and he spoke at the Social Science Association, which in itself is a bit of a revelation to me. I hadn't realized that there was a Social Science Association in 1875, but there was, and they were meeting in Brighton. And he gave this talk called Hygeia, a city of health. And you can see his, his, his definition of what a city of health would be like. A community so circumstanced and so maintained by the exercise of its own free will, guided by scientific knowledge, etc. Uh, so very interesting sort of notions of, of this. And if you read, and it's quite a short little document, it's about 30 or 40 pages, it was, because it was a lecture. <clears throat> Back then they didn't have PowerPoint, so they had to print it. Um, but this is what he envisaged a healthy city would look like. And it's worth thinking about as we look at some of our cities today. 100,000 people, and it's interesting, I'd, I'd say in my experience that somewhere between 75 and a couple of hundred thousand people is sort of, uh, uh, from a health point of view, probably of quite an optimum size. Um, and, then, and he was talking about 100,000 people, no buildings rising above 60 feet. And it's very interesting, I do vision workshops with um, communities where we go through a guided imagery and then they draw, and you'll see one later on, a shared image of what a healthy community looks like, they almost never draw high rises. They also, incidentally, almost never include cars. So people's vision of what a healthy community is today doesn't include high rises and doesn't include cars. And what have we built? There's a real disjunction here that's worth thinking about. <coughs> no, um, railways running beneath the major highways, a subway system, side roads lined with trees. It sounds very modern. And it actually, I think, and I've not really had a chance to dig into this, but I see such reflections of this in the Garden City movement that, that I'm sure, I mean, Ebenezer Howard was, what, 15 years later, 20 years later, I'm sure that there was a, a cross-fertilization going on here because this was much talked about at the time and quite influential. The houses he envisaged would be light and airy, brick-built, smoke-free, roof gardens. Does this sound familiar? Isn't this what we talk about today? So in 150 years, we've made just about zero progress in some respects, in terms of our thinking, perhaps. But we go back to these same models, these same ideas. Um, and, and then this I found fascinating. He actually had a passage in there where he talked about the fact that he didn't want big hospitals where people only looked at people's organs. Does that sound familiar? So he was really talking about what we perhaps today might call a community health centre or, or a, a cottage hospital, we used to call them in, in England. Um, no alcohol or tobacco, um, and, and so on. So really quite fascinating. So there's that history, and then I'm going to jump a bit, and I'm going to jump into Canada and jump forward about uh, 30 or more years. <coughs> How many people here have ever heard of the Commission on Conservation? Oh, I love talking to people who've never heard of the <laughs> Fascinating organization, and I'm very indebted, incidentally, to um, Peter Oberlander, who came to a conference in 1984 that I organized. We invited him to talk about... Uh, Peter Oberlander, if, if you don't know, was a, a great urbanist in, in um, Vancouver at UBC. <clears throat> and he came and he talked about healthy cities. That's what we invited him to talk about. 
and he introduced me to the Commission on Conservation, to uh, Thomas Adams, that I'll come to in a minute. <coughs> the Commission on Conservation was set up in Canada, modeled on a commission that Roosevelt had set up as president in the US. And what's really interesting is this. This is a quote from Charles Hodges. First of all, this is, instead of conservation, think sustainable development. So this is the, uh, a commission 100 years ago that was really a commission about sustainable development. And part of that that they had, which our current understanding of sustainable development often doesn't encompass, was in fact public health. So they had a public health committee of the Commission on Conservation. And Charles Hodgett, who was a medical health officer from Ontario, was the secretary of this. And this is one of the things that he wrote in about 1912. There are two important factors in the question of natural conservation, the physical and the vital. And you can read the rest of it yourselves. But they understood that it wasn't just about the conservation of, of, um, of uh, natural resources, but it was also the conservation of, of people, of vital resources, of what we might call human capital today. Um, and so they had this public health committee. And the public health committee, obviously with the sort of history that there was of, of, of garden cities and Hygiea and all the rest of it, and the history of public health going back to Chadwick, uh, was very interested in town planning. Um, and, and as, as uh, Hodgett said, in housing and town planning, we're dealing with most of the former, that's to say conservation of natural resources, and all of the latter, conservation of, of human resources. And so they organized, a, in 1913, a national conference on housing and town planning, and they brought over Thomas Adams. Now, Thomas Adams had been the secretary uh, to uh, Letchworth, the first secretary of one of the early garden cities in England, Letchworth and was a great town planner in England. And he came out in 1914 and stayed in Canada till 1919. And this is the origins of public health, uh, sorry, of urban planning in Canada. Um, and, and, and it came out of public health, and there was a great link between urban planning and public health in those early days, and really right through until probably the Second World War. And then it kind of fell apart. And part of what we're trying to do today is stitch it back together again. And he did a lot of things that you can see here. I'm not going to read all of this list off. It's there for you to see. <clears throat> but, but that linkage, I think, is really important. And, and so Hodgetts actually said, um, also, it is not so much the city beautiful, this was at the time of the city beautiful movement, of course, in Chicago and all the rest of it, as the city healthy that we want for Canada. So we didn't even invent the term. They had it 100 years ago, this notion of the city healthy, or Hygiea, the city of health and so on. So that does bring me then to Toronto, and I'm going to very quickly skip through this. <clears throat> but in 1915, Maclean's magazine ran an article describing Toronto as the healthiest of large cities, and they were looking at comparable sized cities, up to 350,000 in, 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 in the US, Canada, and uh, I'm not sure if it's all of Europe, but certainly in England. And, <clears throat> and they found Toronto to be the healthiest of all of those cities. Um, and again, you see this new idea consisted of conserving the human asset. You can see the crossover with the Commission on Conservation that was running at the same time as this, uh, and the cross-fertilization that was going on. Charles Hastings, um, <clears throat> again, another of my heroes, uh, and, and so I had the great fortune of going to work in this Department of Public Health in Toronto in 1980, that Charles Hastings had been such a, a leader of in, in, the, in the 20s, or the 1910s and the 1920s. He actually became attracted to public health because his daughter had died of TB, and, and it was because of unpasteurized milk. And so one of the first things that they did was they pasteurized the milk uh, in Toronto. And Toronto was one of the first cities in, in the world to insist on that. Um, uh, they also um, began chlorinating drinking water in 1919, one of the first cities in the world to do so. And they were also chlorinating sewage and filtering the water by 1915. So, so there was a whole sort of leadership role in, in Toronto, not just in Canada, but people were coming from all over the world in public health to look at what was going on in Toronto and try and understand that. There's a very interesting book about this uh, by Heather, Heather McDonald, I think it is. I can give you the reference later if you're interested. And what Hastings also did, which was very interesting, was he expanded the, the role of a the, the, what public health is all about. So he included a, a department of industrial hygiene, uh, social welfare, housing, school health, and, and then municipal housekeeping. 
Um, we might not like to call it municipal housekeeping today, but many of those same ideas are, are still around. But he had such a broad notion of what constituted public health. And the impact was quite dramatic. The mortality rate from typhoid fever dropped 90% between 1910 and 1915. So you can see the benefits of chlorinating your drinking water. Um, the last case of smallpox was recorded in 1932, and the last diphtheria death in 1934. So this huge progress in public health, combination of engineering and, and immunization and education and social change. And social change is a very important part of it as well. All of which led uh, Jesse Parkfit um, uh, writing in England in 1986 um, to, to say this, which I think is very true and sort of sums up a lot of that history, that many would be surprised to learn that the greatest contribution to the health of the nation of the past 150 years was not made by doctors or hospitals, but by local government. And I think it's worth flagging local government. It wasn't provincial and national governments that were leading this. It was local governments. Um, and, and the problem is that so little had been written about it, we sort of lost that piece of history. So that's my take on the history. And it's a very much a personalized take and, and influenced by being in Toronto, of course. But let me move on and talk about, that's the past, what about the present? And the present really starts, for me, in the early 1980s. Um, building on the past, not just the sort of past I've just described to you, but also the past of, of some really interesting developments in, in, in Canada, uh, with the Lalonde Report, in which, which established a whole new way of thinking about health, uh, when Mark Lalonde was the Minister of Health when it was released. Of course, he didn't write it, but he, it had his name on it, it's always known as the Lalonde Report. Uh, public health in the 1980s, which happened before I got to Toronto, but drew me to Toronto and to wanting to work there, was really a kind of a municipal version. And it was really going back and again, Toronto asserting or reasserting its leadership in terms of thinking about what public health in a city was all about. Um, the Health Advocacy Unit, which is where I went to work in, in uh, 1979, the mission statement I've already men mentioned. All of which led us to start thinking about, so what is a healthy city? We've got this mission statement that we're going to be the healthiest city in North America. Um, what did it mean and how are we going to get there? Uh, so, in 1984, we had a conference called Beyond Healthcare, which is the conference, and I, I organized this conference, that brought up um, uh, Peter Oberlander, it brought up um, Len Duhl from Berkeley, uh, and, and others. Um, and, and that's where we started to relaunch Health in Toronto 2000. Um, and the idea got picked up by a very important woman in this process, Ilona Kickbush, who was the Regional Officer for Health Promotion for WHO in Europe. And she took the idea of healthy cities, which is sort of what she'd been looking for but hadn't quite known she was looking for, and she saw it at this conference, she came to the conference, and took it back and founded the European Healthy Cities Project for WHO. And I, I became an advisor to that and worked with her over the, a number of years and, and many others. Out of that, one of the things that um, we did was in 1986, Len Duhl and I, I was uh, at Berkeley for six weeks, and we wrote the uh, the background paper for the WHO Europe Healthy Cities project. And in that, we tried to get a handle on, okay, so what is a healthy city? And we went to the literature, such as it was, and tried to figure out what does the evidence tell us about what's important to the health of people who live in cities. And so some of it's pretty obvious, some of it's kind of surprising and interesting. So a clean, safe, high quality physical environment, duh. You know, that's what Chadwick and all those successors have been doing for a hundred or more years. An ecosystem which is stable now and sustainable in the long term. That was, well actually the idea was there. It was there with the Commission on Conservation. Um, but it hadn't been as prominent for a while. A strong, mutually supportive and non-exploitative community. We were really clear about that piece because strong communities can be very nasty communities too. And uh, I've never forgotten Aaron Antonovsky, um, who is... is uh, He's dead now, but he was a, a great sort of social scientist and developed this notion of the concept of coherence um, and, and, and how important it was to have a sense of coherence. And I asked him once if you could measure the sense of coherence of a community as opposed to individuals. And he said, well, if you measured the sense of coherence of Nazi Germany in the German population, it would have been very high at the time. 
they had a very strong sense of coherence, but it was a very nasty form of coherence. So strong communities are not necessarily healthy communities unless you can introduce some qualifiers like non-exploitative, whether it's exploitating minorities, exploitating the world, um, exploiting minorities or exploiting other communities uh, or, or, uh, or exploiting people on the other side of the world. It doesn't really matter. So um, that's the third. But all, all of this was supported in the literature. A high degree of public participation. Participation is empowering in and of itself. In and of itself, it is good for you to feel more in control, more participating, um, and, and there's a lot of evidence around that. Um, and in fact, the definition of health promotion is the process, the WHO definition is the process of enabling people to increase control over and improve their health. So, so participation is in and of itself health promoting for the individual and for the collective, but also it leads to good things if it's done well. The meeting of basic needs is pretty obvious, except we don't do it. So we have homeless people, we have hungry people, we have all of those things still uh, in one of the richest countries in the world, and it's, it's shameful and disgraceful, but it's there. Um, access to a wide variety of experience and resources and, and so this notion of co multiple contacts of diversity of interaction of communication that's one of the things that, that people love about cities they, they say but it's also you know there's being socially isolated being alone um, we know is bad for health and there's all sorts of good epidemiology about the importance of social networks and social connections to people's health and how unhealthy it is to be isolated and lonely and alone um, not necessarily, it's if it's, it's, you feel those things. A diverse, vital and innovative city economy, you've got to have the funding to buy the things you need as, as a society. Whether we're talking about sewers or whether we're talking about universal education, you need enough level of wealth to provide those public goods because those are fundamental to good health and that requires uh, a, an economy that's adequate to do that. And then this really interesting one about connectedness with the past, with culture, with biological heritage. So a connection with something bigger than yourself, and in fact bigger than your, 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 your net, social network in a sense, um, also comes out that people who have this sense of connectedness seem to, seem to do better. Um, and obviously you then need a city form that's compatible with that. So what sort of city form encourages connectedness with the past, with cultural and biological heritage? Because that begins to have, if those things are important to health and we want to create healthier cities, then you have to start creating an urban form that actually does that. Uh, and, and so that brings in issues of heritage and conservation and all the rest of it. Obviously, you want an optimum level of appropriate public health and sick care services. And, and I make a real distinction between health services, if you like, or health systems. The city is a health system. The whole city is a health system. It's a system that can generate good health if it's done right. It can also be an illness generating system, obviously. But what we call the healthcare system really isn't a healthcare system, it's an illness care system. We only use it when we're sick, for the most part. And that's what it's there for. Nothing wrong with that. I worked, I was trained in that. It's good work. But it's not what generates good health. And then obviously you want both high health status and low disease status, and they're not quite the same thing. So you need both. So that's, that's a set of criteria that we drew out of the literature at the time, and it was admittedly, I have, we had six weeks, it's a pretty swift scan. But that's, that set of uh, criteria has kind of stood the test of time and is still quite widely used. If you don't like lists, maybe you like models. Here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this was a, a model I developed um, in, the, in the 80s, I guess, and, and influenced by other folks, of course. But, <clears throat> basically looking at the interaction between community, environment and economy and saying that if you get the social environment, the physical environment and the economic environment right, then at the centre health or more broadly human development uh, is optimised. And in fact what you really want to do is try and overlap those circles the more, as much as possible and, and just graphically if you think about that, the more you overlap them, the bigger that space at the centre, the higher you might argue the level of, of human development that you get. But then it becomes a matter of balance. So when we come on later to talk about governance, part of the whole point of governance 
is how do you get the balance right between all of these? How do you, for example, not sacrifice your social condition to the economy or your natural environment to the economy? It usually tends to be that way around, not the other, but it can go both ways. We also came up with a definition, very much influenced by the WHO's definition of health promotion. Um, and all I want to talk about here is one of the things we've said right from the get-go is a healthy city is not about simply its status. It's about the process that is happening within that city or that town or that community and how it is working to be more healthy. So fundamentally, it doesn't matter whether you have high or low health status. You can have a high health status, but be paying no attention to health, uninterested in it, not doing anything about it. That doesn't make you a healthy city just because you've got high health status. So it's this process of continually creating and improving these physical environments and community resources. It's the ongoing effort. I've always liked the uh, US Public Health Service at one point had a definition of a goal as a timeless statement of aspiration. You're always stretching, you're always reaching for it, it's always out there. And, and you never stop trying to be better than you are. Um, so I, that, that's what we're trying to get at here. And then I just draw your attention to the end there, where we talked about this as being about enabling people to develop to their maximum potential. So again, we're seeing health in much broader terms than simply being about um, whether or not you woke up this morning with, with heart disease or whatever. But about what's your full potential as a human being. So it's really about human development uh, and health is just a sort of shorthand for that. Also, um, a lovely quote I got from Len, and I actually was trying to trace this back uh, for this speech, and I can't find where I originally got this. It was years ago now and lost in the mist of times. But I really like this. Almost every planner I know is at heart a dreamer with a conscience. We got any dreamers with conscience out here? I hope so. Um, and each of us in the back of his mind has a dream, a healthy world, a better place for our children and hopefully for ourselves. So that's why we're in this business, at least that's why I'm in this business. So it does begin with, with a vision or a dream. And here are a couple of those visions or dreams. These are actually, these are very typical of the sort of pictures that we get. These actually came from our graduate students at the School of Public Health because in their first week on site, we do a healthy vision, healthy community vision workshop and they draw these pictures. And these are just like every picture I've ever seen. First of all, nobody draws better than a seven-year-old child. Uh, so you get these very childlike images. Uh, in fact, I've learned over time, I forbid artists, engineers, planners, or designers to draw first or second or third because they, they just frighten everybody else off. So you have to keep them out of it for a while. Um, interestingly enough, in a healthy community, it's always summer and the sun is always shining. But also there's some very common things. There's, it's always green, there's always water, there's always a center. As I commented earlier, usually you don't see high rises, you don't see cars. Um, it's really fascinating what, what, when you sort of get down to some very, I think, quite deep notions of what makes for a healthy community. Now, how do you do that in the center of Toronto or Vancouver or whatever is a challenge. But if this is what people value, and, and on the topic of value and visions, uh, Clem Bezo, a good friend of mine who's a, um, one of the leading futurists in the world, and particularly a health futurist, um, has said that vision is values projected into the future. And so what you see here is really an expression of people's values. It's depicted, it's a vision, it's depicted as a picture, but embedded in that is a whole set of values about the way the world should be or the values we hold. So how do you do this? Um, I think there's really just, it, it, in some ways, four simple but, but not simple uh, approaches. Uh, the first is community involvement. That's really the bedrock. How do you engage people? If you believe in empowerment, if you believe that participation is good in and of itself, if you believe you get better decisions by doing that anyway, then how do you involve people? That's the bedrock. Um, political commitment is also essential. You can't do this stuff if the mayor and the council uh, are, are not interested or even are opposed to it. So you have to have some political commitment to go along with that. Uh, you have to have what a, it, the jargon is intersectoral partnerships. You have to work 
beyond government. So it's not just about government. You have to work with, with the private sector, with the community sector, with the non-profit sector, with the faith sector, with uh, the academic sector, and so on. How do you get everybody together? So bringing people together to find some common vision and some common purpose um, can be very powerful. And when it's done well and done right, that process can, can lead to 20 years of good work. And then you want to try and codify all of that in, in what we call healthy public policy. Uh, so public policies that are good for health. So what's a healthy housing policy? A housing policy that's good for people's health. What's a healthy transportation policy? What's a healthy agricultural policy or food system policy in a city? Um, those are interesting questions of, of public policy. The other thing that I think is really important is that because I come out of a health background and because we come out of this public health background, we talk about, um, about health. But there are other ideas out there, particularly in the last 30 years or so, safe communities, liberal communities, sustainable communities, green communities, age-friendly communities, child-friendly communities. I don't really care what you call it, frankly. Because if you do all those things, you inevitably begin to pump up against the overlaps amongst them. They all contribute to better health, but better health contributes to those too. And so there's a kind of a, a reciprocity here. So there's a variety of different ways to come at what is really the same intent, which is how do you maximize the, the quality of life and well-being of people, all the people who live in this community. So, so understanding the relationships among all of those and, and not trying, trying not to be too jealous about it's healthy communities, we're not going to do safe, we're not going to do sustainable. You know. Sustainable and healthy internet is very much two sides of the same coin. Then there's something that I call my 1890-100 rule of the built environment. And, and uh, it's always quite shocking, I think. I mean, people know this one, we're 80% urbanized, that's pretty well understood. Uh, and, and we're not incidentally the most urbanized um, society in the world by a long chalk. But what we often don't know is this one, 90. We spend 90% of our time indoors in North America and Europe. And so where we are right now, this building in a city is the natural, quote unquote, the normal, the usual environment of human beings in the 21st century in North America. This is it. So we better do a really good job of making it healthy because we're going to spend a lot of time in it. And actually, we, we haven't. We need to go back and look at that again. Uh, and then finally, um, oh, that's interesting, sorry, wrong button. Uh, there's another interesting factor, isn't it? We, of the remaining 10% of our time, we spend half of it in vehicles. So we're actually only outdoors about an hour a week, on our, an hour a day, sorry, on average. Um, and then the 100%, 100% of the time we live in natural environments, in natural ecosystems. So we shouldn't forget that at all, because that's really fundamental. That's another whole speech, and I'm not going to go there uh, right now. But uh, the built environment is in many ways our most important environment. Globally, this notion of a healthy city has been, I would have to say, a massive success. When we started in Europe, I'd never forgotten we went to our first meeting in, in Lisbon in April of 1986, we thought we'd get, if we were lucky, a dozen cities. 35 showed up from across Europe and we went, whoa, there's something going on here and it has spread since. So now in Europe there are 29 national networks, 90 project cities are allied with the WHO project and they have to pay, I think it's about $10,000 to join too, so this is a pretty serious commitment. In the Western Pacific, 10 countries, 154 cities. I was just in, in Brisbane speaking at the Alliance for Healthy Cities uh, a few months ago. Um, Korea alone has 60 cities, uh, and they're doing wonderful work around healthy cities in, in Korea. Eastern Mediterranean, not so many, but a few, including a very active healthy cities program in Tehran. Uh, and I keep meeting them at every conference I go to, and they're really doing fascinating, interesting work. Um, in the Americas, started uh, a bit later, but 18 nations signed an agreement. There's been a lot of work going on. I've spent a certain amount of time in Brazil working there uh, with, with uh, healthy city projects and, and so on. And in Southeast Asia, Africa, not very much at this point, but it has become generally a global movement. 
uh, and it's, it's received global attention. So the, the, the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, a very important WHO commission reported a few years ago, um, had a knowledge network on urban settlements. I'll talk in a minute about hidden cities and about the global research network on urban health equity. I was a part of that network. Sharon Friel, who's coming in March, coordinated that network and had been the scientific director of the WHO Commission. Um, so a lot of history there about thinking about how you do this sort of work in lower and middle income countries in particular. And of course in Canada, um, I was at the 25th anniversary of Rouen Narandas, uh, which was the first city in Canada to declare itself formally to be a healthy city. Uh, I was there last fall, so 25 years they've got of doing this. Um, Ontario established in 92, so I went to their 20th anniversary last year. It was a good year for anniversaries last year. Um, they're a little bit different in, in Ontario because they focus it on municipal government rather than, uh, so they focus it more on communities, whereas Quebec is quite focused on municipal governments. So it's, it's a somewhat different approach. Uh, BC, there was a, a, a BC uh, Healthy Communities Network in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and then we reinstituted it in 2005. Uh, and there's also an Acadian network in uh, northern New Brunswick, in the Francophone community of New Brunswick. And they've all come together recently to re-establish uh, a Canadian Healthy Communities Network. So, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of people. For me, and I've always said this, the fact that we have put health on the agenda of hundreds, if not thousands, of cities and towns and villages around the world is in and of itself a huge success. Whether or not we can go out and measure exactly what happened and exactly what changed. I say it's rather like, you know, you don't go out, we don't go out and try and measure how successful was the labor movement or the women's movement or the peace movement uh, in, in those terms. Uh, the movement is, is the purpose. And so this, in many ways, has become a global movement. Uh, you can go into individual cities and you can find all sorts of interesting things going on. So, I, I, that's, the, that's sort of the, the current status. Let me then talk very quickly, and this is going to, I'm going to skip over some stuff here, probably partly in, in the interest of time, but also because um, you're going to hear from, from Jason Corbyn and from Sharon Freed if you come back in, in February and March, some of this same stuff. Um, but obviously the, the challenge is we live in this urban and urbanizing world. We passed the 50% mark around 2006. We're projected to go up to 61% uh, by 2030, which is not very far away. Um, and, and this is kind of what it looks like. And I don't know if you can read the small print here, but just to point out that in Brazil, according to the way they measure urbanization, the population of Brazil is 87% urbanized, more than Canada, more than the US. Um, Argentina, I think, is also right up there, um, and, and so on. So the, the, the pink areas are more than 75% urbanized countries, and, and you can see already that this is not just a European or North American phenomenon. Um, so, so and, and that's only going to increase uh, as we see the, the urbanization around the world. But within that, you have what a uh, UN Habitat and WHO report a few years ago called hidden cities. And these are the slums and informal settlements where one billion of the world's three billion urbanites live. That's a staggering number when you think about it. So one in three urbanites are living in informal settlements and slums, uh, a billion people. 36% um, of the total urban population globally, 78% in less developed countries. Um, and even in the most uh, the high income countries, the so called developed regions, 6% of the population are living in slums and informal settlements. Um, 54 million people in just those parts of the world. So, what is a slum? Well, a dense, this is the UN habitat definition of a slum a densely populated area with substandard housing and a low standard of living, as depicted by the absence of one or more of those things. Go back to Chadwick, go back to Benjamin Ward Richardson, go back to Hygeia, go back to um, um, Charles Hastings. It's still about water supply, about sanitation, about sufficient living area and durability of construction and security of tenure. It's the same issues that, that we were fighting 150 years ago. 
They're also more exposed to pollution in those places, transport-related injuries, and that's becoming a big issue. Uh, we're getting at what's called an epidemiological transition from infectious diseases as being the major killers to chronic diseases and injuries becoming the major killers. And transport-related uh, injuries in, in low-income communities is a big challenge. Uh, unsafe neighborhoods, less access to education and healthcare and other services and so on. Uh, and more, I'll come back to this point, but more vulnerable to climate change and, and other extreme weather situations. This is what it can look like on the ground. This is a particularly, I think by now, famous image uh, of uh, Paraisopolis on the left um, and Morumbi, which is a, um, a sort of relate, a, a suburb of Sao Paulo uh, associated with the University of Sao Paulo. Um, here, this is pretty stark. Uh, and even allowing for the changes in perspective, I think you can see that some of those hot tubs and certainly some of those balconies look bigger than the, uh, than the uh, houses in the, in the uh, area to the left. So that's the sort of contrasts that, that we're dealing with. Um, so I think there's three big challenges globally as we look ahead about how do we improve the health of cities. And in many ways, they're not very different. Uh, except for possibly that second one, I think, is much more prominent in you know, declining ecosystem health than was the case um, uh, 100 years ago. So the first challenge is inequalities in health, and, and I'm going to slide over some stuff now in the interest of time. Um, but the health of the population, we've already said, is dependent on a variety of non-health care related <coughs> sectors. And inequalities in health largely result from in inequitable access to food and shelter and education and income and safe environments and all the rest of it. Uh, not from lack of access to health services, although that's not completely unimportant. And I've always liked this phrase from Raymond Aron, and about whom I know virtually nothing. So if anyone else here has better knowledge than I do, I, be, I know he's a French philosopher, and I know that he said, or is said to have said, that when inequality becomes too great, the idea of community becomes impossible. I think that's a very true and important point that we need to remember. When you look at, at what's happening, for example, in the US and the degree of inequality there, you don't any longer have a community. You can't have a community when you've got such different worlds, um, any more than you could have a community between Paraisopolis and Morumbi in that picture. So um, we think that. Um, that, that, as I say, there's also this epidemiological transition going on that we need to be aware of. The second big challenge is declining ecosystem health, and I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about declining ecosystem health. Uh, the picture on the left is the ecological footprint going inexorably up. The picture, the, the graph on the right, is um, the um, Living Planet Index from the Worldwide Fund for Nature going inexorably down. Um, and uh, the, the, the global map is uh, climate change and global warming. Uh, we have huge, and I'm actually co-chairing a Canadian Public Health Association work group looking at the health implications, the public health implications of all of this and what a public health response should be. Because when ecosystems decline, then societies decline. Because we live 100% of the time within natural ecosystems. And when they collapse, societies collapse. And, and that's potentially where we're heading. And I wrote a piece uh, a year or two ago now, declining ecosystem health is the threat to health in the 21st century. I don't think we've yet really come to understand that. And there's all sorts of ways in which ecosystem health uh, impacts on human health, but these are four of the big ones. Uh, I wrote with a colleague of mine, Kate Davies, now down in Seattle at Antioch. Um, climate and atmospheric change, pollution and ecotoxicity, resource depletion, and loss of habitat, species, and biodiversity. Uh, so those sorts of changes and the same kind of changes here, I'll skip over this one because it says much the same, but this is a report by Tony McMichael and Colin Butler in Australia uh, at the same university that Sharon Field teaches at. I was just there uh, a couple of months ago um, talking to these folks. So. We've known, I mean, this is nothing new. This is 12 years ago now, 13 years ago. Uh, World Resources talking about this. In every respect, human development and human security are closely linked to the productivity of ecosystems. 
Our future rests squarely on their continued viability. So that has implications for, for cities, and I'll skip over this one. But history teaches us, um, and, and some of you I'm sure have read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse and, and others, uh, that, that when ecosystems decline and collapse, so do societies. Uh, and then what you get is you actually get an overlap between ecosystem change and social system change. The poor classically live downwind, downstream. Why do you think the east end of cities is the poor end in London, for example? Well, check which way the river runs and check which way the wind blows. If you believed in the miasma theory of disease, which was not a bad theory to believe in, and is in many respects sort of right in a sense, airborne disease and waterborne disease, you want to be upwind and upstream. So the rich can afford it and they drive up property prices because they move upstream and upwind. <coughs> so the west end of London is rich. The east end is poor because that's downwind and downstream. And you can see this repeated in cities all over the world, similar sorts of patterns. So downwind, downstream, downhill. Who lives on the steep slopes in Rio? It's not the wealthy because those slopes are liable to collapse. Um, on floodplains and other marginal lands, near landfills and industrial plants, there's a whole notion of environmental justice that's come out of the US, uh, which is a largely race-based analysis of, of where these kinds of plants get located. And guess what? They tend to get located more in African-American communities or close to African-American communities. Uh, so um, these things are, and it works both ways because when you've got one of those, it drives the property values down and so the people move out if they can afford to. And so on. They do dangerous work, they live in dangerous neighbourhoods. And this is no surprise, we know all this, but, but when that intersects with something like, in this case, the low elevation coastal zone, and I'm not going to go into the technicalities of this, um, but 2% of the world's land area containing 10% of its total population and 13% of the urban population is in these low elevation coastal zones. Well, more extreme weather events, uh, global warming, rising sea levels, guess who's going to get impacted by that? There are over 3,000 cities in this low elevation coastal zone. Um, and so that's not a pretty picture. And here's just in Asia, the, the Asian cities at risk to your sea level rise. But again, who's going to be at risk? Who's going to be living in the floodplains? Who's going to be living in the more marginal coastal zones? Uh, it's going to be income differentiated. We know it is. And so finally, the third challenge is, given these kind of massive social and environmental challenges, how do we establish healthy urban governance? And um, for me, the essence of this and it, it reflects on, I guess, the fact that I'm trained in medicine and, and I, I'm very anthropocentric. I used to have big arguments, not big arguments, but, but when I taught at York in the Faculty of Environmental Studies, there was always this dispute back and forth about ecocentric versus anthropocentric. Uh, I'm anthropocentric, I have no, no bones about it. But for me, the central purpose of government is, or should be, because it often isn't, I don't think, to improve the health and well-being, the quality of life, and the level of human development of all of the citizens. That's what human-centered or people-centered development is all about. And often, I think, cities are better at it than um, federal and provincial governments. And I, I don't know why it only just struck me, but when I was, I was at a conference in, in uh, Melbourne around uh, urban planning and health uh, and regional planning, um, a few months ago, and there was a discussion about modeling economic development and its relationship to human development and so on. And it just struck me that if you look at how we measure progress at a provincial or, or federal level, national governments, provincial governments, very much focus on GDP, always a conversation about how's the GDP doing, how well is it growing, all the rest of it. How many cities do you know that measure progress in terms of their GDP? Any? I don't know any. That's not how they measure progress. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities has spent 20 years developing a quality of life indicator system that a lot of municipalities use. I think there's a very different focus of what government is all about 
in municipal governments than you get at provincial and national governments, which is interesting. And I don't know why it never struck me until a few months ago, but it did, finally. Um, so, and, and then, you know, so it's, it's the people stupid, which is a response to Bill Clinton's famous slogan, it's the economy stupid. Well, actually, no, it's the people stupid. So a focus on people, this is the point I just made. Um, so the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, the WHO Commission that I mentioned earlier, that Sharon was the, uh, Sharon Field was the executive, uh, scientific director of, um, had a focus on healthy urban governance. Recognize that this is a really interesting issue. And so how do you govern cities for health, which is really what healthy cities in many ways is about. We're talking governance, not government. So it's not just what the government does. Governance is much bigger than government. So this is what they had to say in their report, um, what could we, for five years ago already. Um, anyway, uh, new models of governance are required to plan cities that are designed in such a way that the physical, social, and natural environments prevent and ameliorate the new urban health risks. And for that matter, the old urban health risks. Uh, and they recommended that we had to do things such as placing health and equity at the heart of urban governance and planning. So how do you create health-focused or more broadly human-focused government? And again, I say, I think at a municipal level, you're much, more, it's mu you're much more likely to be able to do that. It's an easier step for those governments than for federal and provincial governments. Uh, you have to empower all groups in society. You have to include people. So this notion of participation that Len and I identified as one of the 11 key factors for a healthy city comes back time and time and time again. Um, and enable civil society to organize and act. Uh, so how do we enable that to happen? And we need to go a lot further than, we've, than we do in Britain. I was in Brazil very impressed by um, the, the level of, well, for example, participatory budgeting which started in Brazil. We don't really do participatory budgeting in any meaningful way in Canada, but why not? We need to, that's just a small example of what we need to be doing. Um, and, and they've done sort of the fascinating things going on in Brazil around, around um, democracy. And, and the, uh, in, I was in um, Belo Horizonte, and um, they have appointed a vice mayor for democratization. How many vice mayors for democratization do we have in Canada? And why don't we? You know, so, so we need to be looking, um, not just always thinking we need to look to the South to tell them how to do it, but we need to look to the South to learn how to do it. Um, and then um, I'm, the Global Research Network also looked at these same sorts of issues. I'm just going to skip over a couple of those because Sharon will cover some of that. So again, what it comes down to is this. It's a, it's, it's a matter of political commitment, community engagement, intersectoral action, and healthy public policy. You have to put people at the center, and you have to address the really big global issues, which to my mind are uh, equity and sustainability. And we, the, the place to start that is at the local level. And I'm just going to slide on to my final slide. Um, so excuse this lot. But I, oh, there we go. Just an example of the sort of thinking that I think we need to be having. Um, how many people here have heard of transition towns? Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a new movement that's coming out of, uh, it started in Totnes in Devon, uh, with a small group of people. Um, and as it says, it's small scale, local responses to the global challenges of specifically climate change, economic hardship, and shrinking supplies of cheap energy. But it's, it's uh, again one of these movements that's spreading worldwide. Is transition towns about healthy cities? I think so. Very much so. Um, so we come at the same problem from different angles, but it doesn't really fundamentally matter. But we need to be looking at these sorts of new models. How can we live equitably and sustainably in our cities? And how do, what's the forms of governance that enable us to do so? So that's the future challenge, and as I say, you'll hear a lot more from Jason and Sharon about that if you come to the next couple of lectures. And thank you. So we have time for some questions. I think we have, uh, we have a little less than half an hour left. Uh, uh, Raylene, maybe you'll let me know when we're out of time. So.
Yes, someone right in front, ready to go. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I was struck as you were going through the presentation about our own Aboriginal communities. And your comment about the federal government and the provincial government are probably the least able to, uh, in fact, implement a healthy community. I looked at the definitions also of slum from yes. WHO, yeah. and, and our, a lot of our Aboriginal communities <coughs> reside right in there. Exactly. Can you comment then, I guess, about the apparent real disconnect in our country about the, I guess, the federal government and the provincial government are kind of looking, quote, if I can use that, after the interest constitutionally. But in effect, there's been very little movement over the last number of years to improve the living conditions on these Aboriginal reserves. So well, think, yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's definitely a huge issue. It's actually of particular concern to us in, in uh, the School of Public Health because Indigenous Health is one of our is a focus for our program. Um, and, and we have uh, some, some good people there to work on that. Um, I mean, there's such a, a long history of, of colonialism and racism and exploitation that underlies all of that, uh, that it, it's not going to be readily solved. Um, I've always been struck by the um, comment that um, used to come out of South Africa that, well, you know, they just took the Canadian model and, and that's how they created apartheid. Uh, that's a very damning indictment. So th there aren't easy answers, but, but certainly, I mean, I think things that we're seeing now, such as the, uh, the I don't know, war movement, so, um, there, is, there is a reason for rage there. And uh, the astonishing thing in some respects is, is uh, that it hasn't come sooner. Um, but I think it's an incredible stain on, on the, the conscience of Canada, the way that Aboriginal people are treated in this country. And part of it, I think, the, the healthy city approach at that local level can be a way to, one of the ways to help to heal that. Yeah. Thank you for Thank listening. Um, your history was very interesting to me um, during the first half of your lecture because you seem to skip over between 1930 and 1975-ish. What happened in the middle century? Were you, were you not talking about healthy cities? Um, well, not, not in quite the same way. I think two or three things happened. Um, planning became, I think, very sort of... Um, maybe lost sight of people somewhere in that process. Um, so the, the, the great housing estates, the Corbusier and all of that, uh, sort of became more about the, the building than the people living in it, and all, or the buildings than the people living in it. That's my sense of it, and I'm not an architectural historian. Um, but also, public health moved away from it, or health more broadly moved away from it, because uh, we started to get penicillin and a whole bunch of other things. And so, with the, and really the advent of modern medicine really stems from the, the, the 30s and 40s, and certainly since the Second World War, it's been massive. And so, our whole focus has shifted from a public health approach, which is largely what it was. There was a, um, I forget who it was now, I used to say that you really didn't have more than a 50-50 chance of being helped by a doctor until about 1920. Um, so, so there was much more of a, much less of a focus on health care as, as the way to improve people's health. With the advent not just of penicillin, but penicillin is sort of the beginning of that whole process of, of all of the advances in, in modern medicine since then. Um, we've moved away, and I, I mean, some of you may have seen, I actually had an, uh, an op-ed piece in the Times Commons yesterday about this, about the fact that the Auditor General pointed to the fact that Prevention wasn't a priority if you looked at the spending in the healthcare system, and it isn't. Um, so, so on the one hand, we had, I think, um, architecture and, and urban planning became, becoming much more focused on, in some ways, more abstract notions of, of what was good and what was progress, and public health moving, or health moving away into a medical model. Uh, and so I think both of those, um, and, and I can just 
waiting for the uh, urban plan as an architect to stand up and protest. But, but I think, I agree but, totally. but I think, I think both of those fields have sort of started to go. This is working, and that's why we're beginning to see a realignment. I, I was interested in your anthropocentric, anthropocentric approach because it strikes me as fairly obvious that cities, ecosystems are vital to our survival and city survival, but, the exi but cities tend to make ecosystems less visible. Right? Yes. So the, is there a kind of contradiction in, in I mean, we've got to work harder if we live in cities not to have it anthropocentric perspective as far as I'm concerned. Yes. So what would you think about that case? Well when I say anthropocentric what, I, I, what I'm really getting at is that while on the one hand I don't think that our natural resources were put there for us to use, um, clearly they weren't, you know, we were created within them, but that it is in our best interests to make sure they, that we don't damage them. So, so if you like, my anthropocentric approach to the environment is, I'm not a deep ecologist. You know, a deep ecologist would probably, if you really push them, would tell you, well, the carrying capacity of the Earth is 500 million, and we have to get rid of 6 billion or so people um, eventually. And, and I'm not, and, and not many people are quite that far in that camp. But I come at it from the point of view that because I'm interested in the health of populations, I have to be interested in the health of ecosystems because the health of populations depend on the ecosystem. So my, my interest in the ecosystem is partly um, because I think it's a good thing in and of itself, but also, and probably to a large extent, because I recognize it's fundamental to human well-being. So it's just kind of, I'm not a pure anthropocentric. Now, the point about how do we bring nature back into cities I think is really important. I'm on the board of the Charter and Nature Alliance, which is a new alliance that's come up in the last few years. Um, came out of Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods, and he uh, one, somewhat mischievously invented this, de this um, condition called nature deficit disorder, um, <laughs> which uh, I think should be a diagnosis in and of itself. But anyway. um, and, and there is this growing body and fascinating body of evidence about how contact with nature is important to people in and of itself. Um, so, but the, the challenge that I put out in, in, in talking about this is we can't take the two million people in Metro Vancouver and take them all out to the wilderness. And if we did, we'd destroy the wilderness anyway. So the trick is not how do you get people to nature, it's how do you get nature to people. So how do we naturalize our city? So the notions of green cities um, are exactly about that sort of thing. So I agree, I, you, we definitely have to become much more conscious of our ecosystem. We see, we see it in, in small, lots of small ways too. So people who are re-naturalizing creeks. One of the, is it Seoul? It's Seoul in Korea has re-naturalized an entire river. They had a river went through the center of the city that they had in the 50s covered over with with a highway and, and it had gone. And they removed the highway recently and they opened it up and they renaturalized it at a massive scale, it cost them billions of dollars. But that's a very large scale example of what I'm talking about. But there's lots of small stuff, Bowker Creek or whatever it may be, where we're renaturalizing. And we have to do that, talking about swales, for example, and other natural ways of managing stormwater. Um, I still don't really see why Victoria hasn't looked at living machines as a more viable way of, of managing sewage um, than, than the sort of kind of 19th, early 20th century technology that we are looking at. Uh, but that's another issue. <laughs> I'm going to let you yeah, Sure. Yeah. Just come over here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was particularly interested in the parts where you were talking about the conditions in the slums. Um, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts. When you read someone like, say, Mike Davis, when he's talking about the conditions in slums and the health impacts that are there, he's very Dickensian almost in how he describes it. He's very vivid. Um, but he's also very suspicious of people who think that, and, and the reason I mentioned this is because he talks about democratization. He's suspicious of people that say that 
people in the slums can invent or self-help their own way out of those conditions. Um, how do you think we can strike a balance, or what's your more broader opinion on how do we strike a balance between people being autonomous and democratizing their decisions around their health in their urban communities, and the very real need for outside resources for them to assist in those measures? Well, um, I, I think it's, it's a bit of both. Um, I, I don't believe in what I call the Maggie Thatcher School of Empowerment, which is we're going to take away your basic resources in order to empower you to make decisions for yourselves. Um, and, and you see some of that. So, there's, there's, but on the other hand, there's no question but that the skills and capacities and, of, of people in those situations it can be massive. And if you look at things like Slum Dwellers International and organizations like that that work with slum dwellers, uh, and I don't, I, you know, I, I see this and I watch it, but that's not what I do. Um, but but the work with them, uh, a wonderful example um, that I came across some years ago um, in, in um, Colombia, in Medellin, in fact, and uh, there's a, an organization called the Carvajal Foundation in Medellin, and the city's health officer who subsequently became the mayor and then went on to head up the foundation. That foundation worked with people and it would, for, for example, part of what it did, lots of small businesses, but small businesses that were badly run because people had no training in small business management. So they give them small business management training to make them more effective small business people. Um, when it came to building, they, they, they purchased building materials for self-build, but they, they would pass them on at um, wholesale rates um, to, to sort of to take out the middleman and make it more affordable and then support people in training how to build and so on. So a combination of supported self-help and those kind of external supports, I think you, you've got to do both. It's not an either or. And I certainly don't believe uh, that you can simply say to people, well, you know, just, it's kind of like the other one I think of it, it, it's kind of like the, the, the Nancy Reagan approach to that, to poverty, which is just say no to poverty. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yes, this ties in a little bit to what you've been talking about, but how, do you have ideas for reducing the economic inequities? Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, yes, we can start with the living wage. Yeah. That would be a good place to start. Um, I was interested that was on the radio this morning as it happened, so it's sort of quite topical. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the ways I put it, it was in my op-ed, uh, and I talked about it on the radio this morning too, but um, if you start to look at how much poverty costs us, just in economic terms, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives did a recent analysis for BC, and they estimated, I think their final sum was something like eight billion dollars. When you look at the excess costs associated with poverty, uh, so the, the poor health that's associated with poverty generates an extra cost on the healthcare system. Not to mention people who can't work, lost productivity, lost income, lost taxes for that matter. Um, uh, higher social service costs, higher crime costs, and other uh, justice system costs, and so on. The question is, is poverty now so expensive that we can't afford it? And do we need to actually invest? And, and they estimate that the cost of an anti-poverty strategy, and BC doesn't have an anti-poverty anti strategy, but several other provinces do, Quebec and Newfoundland and, and now Ontario and so on, um, and are having some success with it too. Um, we need an anti-poverty strategy in BC. We need to couple that with things such as the living wage. And the, the gap between the minimum wage and the living wage is huge. So that in, in Victoria right now, the living wage is something like $18 an hour. And the minimum wage is, what, $10 or $11 an hour? So the minimum wage isn't a living wage. So we need to close that gap. Um, so people are going to squeal, but you know it can be done. There's other places in the world, other models that you can look at. I mean, I particularly think of Sweden because I spent a lot of time there. Uh, that are successful countries that manage quite well without our levels of poverty. So we don't have to have these levels of poverty, but we have to have a commitment to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Exactly right. And what we saw with slum clearances, for example, in the in the 40s and 50s, and well, the, the 40s, the slum clearance was called bombing. But um, in the 1950s and, and 60s, and you know, my 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 father was born in Sheffield. Um, he was a coal miner's son. Uh, so that side of my family lived in 19th century sort of tenement style row houses, and they counted themselves very fortunate that their street was not demolished. Uh, because the stuff that went up, these big high-rises that became very anti-human in many ways, destroyed community, um, and, and it, they didn't. So there's a lesson to be learned in that. And, and the lesson, I think, is if you take that informal settlement, you have to upgrade it. You don't go in and demolish it and put in a bunch of high-rises. You go in and work with that community to upgrade it, and, and there's lots and lots and lots of examples around the world of how you do that and you, you, how you can put in drainage is one of the first things you want to put in, for example. Um, street drainage, so the streets are no longer muddy and impassable, uh, so then you can get transportation in. Um, you've got to bring in some basic things I saw it in Brazil, like policing and so on, uh, but education is even more important, so making sure the schools are there and the schools work, those sorts of things. But retain the community and help the community to develop itself uh, and develop it. I mean, it's not, you can't, again, it's not just, you know, you can't just say, go away and build a school. You know, you have to bring a school in, you have to bring teachers in, you have to bring all those things in. But you have to do it with the community. I'm going to ask a question, Trevor. You sort of pushed against measurability at one point in your talk. You said, <coughs> You know, there's a, this is something not measurable in the fashion of the peace movement or the mm -hmm. labor movement. Yeah. Um, um, but then that statistic you showed about the typhoid reduction in Toronto, for example, is such a powerful statistic. If you wanted to advocate coronation mm -hmm. or uh, pasteurization in 1916, that would seem a very powerful piece of evidence. Uh, what are the efforts in the field to generate public health uh, statistics. What kinds of push? What kind of push is there towards measurability? Can, and, and are there measurable? In, are, there, are there examples of places where these measurements are demonstrating progress? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I, I should say I'm not anti-measurement. Um, uh, I, I am a little concerned about how it's so often the only focus. Um, and John McKnight has a wonderful phrase that I, I use all the time, that institutions learn from studies, but communities learn from stories. And you need both. You need both. Um, so there's been a lot of effort. I mean, one of the earliest workshops we did in the WHO Europe uh, program was around indicators. And indicators and measures have always been very important, and it's part of the condition of being in those projects. Um, I, I think that where you can run into problems is with issues of attribution. So that it was a lot easier in when you had a very quick response, when you put in chlorination and typhoid went away and it was very obvious, the attribution was very clear. It's a lot more difficult sometimes to, to make the link between an intervention here and an outcome 20 years later in a chronic disease there. And so that becomes a bit of a challenge, but it's more a challenge of attribution. We can measure it, and we should measure it. Um, I tend to take the other tack, so I've said to cities, um, if things improve, take credit for it. Yeah. And defy people to prove that it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, I mean, it, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of measures out there in all sorts of, both small and large communities, and it's done quite a lot. Um, I just worry a bit about getting too fixated on the numbers. 
and particularly when you, as I say, you're dealing with attribution problems of complex issues that have impacts 20 or 30 years later. So that, that's my only reservation. Yeah, okay. Um, how much, uh, what impact, I guess, are you finding that this healthy cities perspective is having within the planning profession? And because you mentioned it at the very early phase in the 19 teens, but uh, in terms of moving away from a, sort of a narrow modernism to embrace, I guess, equity and sustainability and yeah. move away, I guess, from real estate interests and that kind of a perspective, which maybe increases well, inequality? It, it's definitely happening. Um, so, for example, when, when we first set up the uh, Canadian Health and Communities Network in 1988, um, and I was involved in writing the proposal for that and getting it to happen. We very deliberately placed the office at the Canadian Institute of Planners. We didn't want this to become another health project. Um, and, and they were quite seized with it. And then unfortunately what happened is it was federally funded and the funding was cut in the budget cuts of 92. And so that kind of severed that link to some extent. But, but we've been rebuilding it, and I, I've worked with urban planners over the years quite a lot. There's been, particularly here in BC, there's something called the Healthy Built Environment Alliance that we've set up that brings together architects and planners and public health people and so on, um, to develop courses on, on um, planning 101 for public health and public health 101 for planners, those sorts of things. So there's a, a growing interest. The, the Canadian Institute of Planners has uh, recently put out a whole bunch of guidelines and, and manuals about healthy communities again. So it was something that was there in the early 90s. It kind of faded away through the 90s a bit, um, and, and then it started to come back again. Um, but there's, there's quite a lot of interest. I have a friend right now who's uh, got her master's in public health, and she's actually one of our senior instructors at the school, who's finishing her PhD in urban planning at UBC. So people are making those crossover links. And I, I think there's much more of it than, I don't know, there are planners in the audience who can speak more of it than I can. But my sense is that certainly it's much more on the agenda than it was 30 years ago. Thank you. It's still got a long way to go, but. For a final question? Sure, okay. Um, I was just interested, you said that um, cities do a better job of making all these cities than do provincial and federal governments done in Canada. Um, when it comes to um, public policies that affect your criteria of healthy cities, of course, it seems like the vast majority of policy and power lies with federal and provincial governments. And so municipal governments have such a limited <coughs> policy toolkit, if you will. So, um, I mean, obviously, there's constitutional reform, but yes. far barring that, um, can you just cite some of the, maybe some, how to go about overcoming that? Maybe cite some examples in Canada of how that well, I mean, I, just to go back to the, the point you made, that uh, it is a constitutional issue, that it's an order of government that has no constitutional existence, and I think that needs to change, actually. But I'm not holding my breath for constitutional amendments. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. Um, I, I mean, I think you see it in, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, so when we, when we see cities that are working on things such as walkability indexes and looking at how walkable their community is or looking at how to make their community more safe or looking at um, having a food policy uh, council or food policy system uh, or looking at um, naturalizing their, their um, stormwater management or on and on and on and on and on, all sorts of little ways. And it's, 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 it's that combination of all of those things that it's, it's trying to understand that ev almost every decision you make is going to have some sort of health or human well-being impact and you can make it better for health or worse for health or neutral but but you can you can have those impacts and it can be very small things and it can be very big things um, but it, it's like the, it, it's that constant drip of change this is not a, a quick change process um, I, I had this um, Whiteboard here, I'm not going to use it in the interest of time, I don't think. But, um, oh, what the hell. <laughs> I'll just show you this because this is how I think about the change process. And I found it, it works. Um, so, 
far it is. It's about, it's about what this is, is vision-directed muddling through. So this is a visual depiction of vision-directed muddling through. And so here you are in your harbour, in your sailboat, here's the land, and you want to get, you and your crew want to get to this island up here. And between you and the island, there's a bunch of reefs. So if you're in a powerboat, which is what I think um, some people think we have, you just turn on the engine and you zip up there, nice and easy. That's called strategic planning, you know. But the reality is that the wind is from there. And so, how do you get in a sailboat with no engine from here to there when the wind's that way? Tack. You tack. So, the process of change in a community is you tack and you don't hit the reef, so you come back a little bit. And then you come out here and you keep going and you're doing quite well and then the wind starts to get really strong and it's blowing very hard. And so you spend a lot of time doing this. Anybody in the community ever done this? <laughs> we all have. So then what happens if the wind's really strong? Well, you tuck back in here behind the reef and take shelter. And if it really is nasty, you pretty much have to drop all your sails and run back to the harbour and take shelter, right? This is when they evaluate you and conclude that you've done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the programme should be cut. <laughs> so what happens after a storm? Well, often what happens after a storm is you get a wind change. What's that called in the community? That's an electron. <laughs> yeah. So the political winds are blowing in a different direction now. The old tack isn't going to work. And so you come out, you're on an entirely different tack. And you're doing okay, and you occasionally have to double round the reef a bit, but you're getting there. And you're getting out here, things are looking good, and the wind dies. Energy goes completely out of the community. Ever seen that happen? So what do you do in a sailboat when the wind dies? You can paddle, maybe. You can anchor. My favourite is you bring the six-pack up on deck and you wait for the wind to come back. So what happens is eventually the wind comes back and of course it's in exactly the right direction. Except that now the owners or the crew or whatever have decided they actually want to go to this island over here. <laughs> so I think that that's how change happens in this community. And I do this with communities and I get the same reaction. A lot of head nodding. Oh yeah, that's how it works. And so what we need is not so much a master plan, which is to turn on the engine and go there, as a master process that says we're going to. This is our vision, but we're going to have to muddle through to get to it. And because of that, there's no master plan. There's, there's a sense of where you want to get to, and a lot of flexibility and adaptability, and taking the long term. And of course, the other key thing about sailing is the whole point of sailing is to enjoy the trip. So, enjoy the trip. <laughs>